afternoon. My name is Tracy, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the first of our Data PW webinar series conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number 1 on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you, and I'll now introduce and turn the call over to Mr. Tim Leyland, National PD Director. You may begin your conference, sir. Thank you, and uh, as mentioned, good afternoon, everyone. This is Tim Lee, your National PD Director speaking. Hope everyone had a chance to enjoy a voice of a village call, so we appreciate you getting on a second conference call today, if you were in fact on that first one. Um, this is, of course, you'll probably remember from last year, it covers the key clinical elements of managing patients on PD, and is recommended for all DaVita, DaVita medical directors, neurologists, and nurses who have or plan to place patients on PD. Today, into the mix of physicians and the teammates, and we're happy to see that such a growing interest in the therapy. For attendance, I want to remind you that you're eligible for, to receive one continuing education credit for today's presentation. The course code is CEC2040 hyphen eval. Again, that's CEC2140 hyphen eval, and I will place that to the chat window here shortly for your reference. A uh, reminder, all of our webinar sessions from our last series are recorded and available for demand access. We often reference back previous webinars, webinars rather, in our current webinars, so feel free to go back and watch these legacy presentations. As the operator mentioned, we will have a Q&A session at the end. You can ask questions in multiple ways. Of course, you can wait to the end of the presentation and ask your question live, or you can type them in the chat box in the webinar panel, and we will ask them for you. All right, today's topic is prevention of peritoneal dialysis-related infections. And now, I pass it over to Tracy Milligan, our Senior Director of Clinical Services, who will introduce today's speaker. Tracy. Thank you, and thanks, everyone, for taking time out of your schedules to join us. It's a great honor to be able to introduce today's speaker for our call. Our speaker today is Dr. Hector Rodriguez. He's the medical director for DeVita Cedar Sinai Medical Center Renal Replacement Therapy Services in Los Angeles, California. He's a clinical professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, has a nephrology practice in Beverly Hills, and is board certified in internal medicine and nephrology. Dr. Rodriguez is also a member of the DeVita Physicians Council, and he is the group medical director for Dream Team and Polaris. So, Dr. Rodriguez, take it away. Thank you, and good, uh, good morning for those in the West Coast. Uh, uh, the, this webinar was intended originally to cover both prevention and management of peritoneal dialysis-related infections. This is really too broad of a topic to be discussed in the allocated time. Um, for that reason, I chose to focus on prevention aspect. The aspect of peritoneal dialysis infection may be discussed in a separate session. It is important to realize that these educational sessions are really not intended to give you directions on how to conduct business at your clinics. The data practice guidelines are robust and based on solid medical evidence and must be adhered to. The purpose of these educational sessions is really to give you better insight in the field of peritoneal dialysis and to give you the opportunity of becoming better informed and medically sophisticated caregivers. This, I believe, should translate into superior patient care. So uh, let me uh, present to you the outline, the outline of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to find peritoneal-related infections, discuss prevention of peritonitis, key aspects of peritoneal infections, as well as monitoring of peritonitis rates, as exercise care, and vital importance of training the peritoneal dialysis patient. I think it's fair to say that uh, infection is really the Achilles heel of peritoneal dialysis. And as in the Greek mythology, Achilles would only die if he struck in the right heel. 
Uh, the same token, peritoneal dialysis, biggest chance to survival is infection. And I believe this infection can be prevented. Uh, the, the, pro, the, the, the therapy will grow, uh, will, will grow consistently. Uh, many of you are aware, of course, that of the uh, problems with peritonitis. Uh, peritonitis is a contributing factor to death in 16% of deaths on peritoneal dialysis. Into membrane failure is a major cause of, for switch to hemodialysis and the most common cause of peritoneal dialysis technical failure. So you can see how when you get peritonitis, you basically may lose patients die or they move to hemodialysis. A very basic uh, concept on prevention of infection in peritoneal dialysis is the fact that this is a closed system. As long as this is a closed system, there is no infection. However, the minute the system opens, there is a risk of infection. And this is something that should be kept in mind and so since the peritoneal dialysis patient should understand and comprehend fully, many of the cases of infections are due to the lack of understanding or remembering that this is really a closed system, and whenever you open the system, you have to go through an elaborate uh, path to minimize the risk of infection. So why focus on prevention? Well, for one thing, it is the right thing to do for the benefit of all our patients. Um, an effective preventive program may really potentially eliminate peritoneal dialysis-related infection. This should be a goal that we at the beta should strive for. At some point, we should really have infections in peritoneal dialysis. The International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis, or ISPD, has issued guidelines that are specifically uh, aimed at reducing the risk of peritoneal dialysis-related infections. The problem with guidelines that are similar to the KDOKI guidelines is that they are really partially evidence-based, and there are many of these guidelines that are only opinion-based. So therefore, we look at the line as a good point to start, but we do, it doesn't mean that we have to do everything these guidelines uh, propose. Uh, success, really, to prevent peritoneal dialysis infection is a change in the culture of how valuable prevention is. And this is a difficult problem, because culture encompasses not only yourself, your teammates, the, the patient families, but more important, the physicians. And physicians are really not particularly keen into prevention. And for that reason, it is a challenge to get uh, to the point where everybody involved in the care of the, of, the, of the PD patient really thinks in terms of prevention. That's going to take some time, but I think once we get to that point, we'll, we'll succeed. Now, let's send to you two case, real case uh, uh, patients that I confronted in the last few years that, that, that really uh, address the issue of how important pre pre prevention of infection is in peritoneal dialysis. And again, I will ask some feedback from you to see what you think went wrong with this patient and why this patient had this very bad outcome. The case is a 55-year-old Caucasian man, has CK stage 5 from AL amyloidosis. He was on CCDP, CCPD for six years. This guy is the best patient you would want in your program. He worked full time as a paralegal. He had excellent dialysis, adequacy, and biochemical parameters. He only had one single episode of peritonitis in six years of therapy. On Friday evening, in California, you saw thing happen on Friday evening. The titanium connector accidentally dislodged and fell to the floor. The patient panicked. These are his own words. He washed hands with soap and water. He wore the sterile gloves, washed the connector with soap and water, replaced the connector and dialyzed overnight, and did not notify neither the physician nor the peritoneal dialysis nurse. Four days later, he had diffuse abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. When agency room, he didn't have a fever, but he had a diffusely tender abdomen. He had guarding. The blood cell count was normal. He flew in 130 white cells and 320 red cells. The culture negative the, uh, in blood, the peritoneal dialysis fluid culture grew Staphylococcus aureus. He was admitted, he was a tartar in intravenous fluids, vancomycin, and after 10 days, he died of septic shock. This case is a 62 year old Hispanic female, CKD5 to neuroclerosis, on CCPD for three years, had one sort of culture negative peritonitis during the first six months on PD. She was alive for an elective uh, resection of soft tissue masses in the back that proved to be lipomas, and she left the hospital after three days. 
to discharge, she developed cloudy, PD fluid, and low grade fever. The white blood cell count was normal. The peritoneal fluid contained 251 cells and 25 per high power field. Patients were negative. PD fluid culture grew, coagulate negative stuff. She was given vancomycin as an outpatient, and she recovered. <coughs> now, this patient had been in the hospital, and the renal case manager contacted her uh, three or four days later and found out that she had peritonitis. So she promptly notified the epidemiologist of the hospital, and the hospital undertook an epidemiologic investigation as follows. Uh, one hospital, the patient was dialyzed by a dialysis. Nurse, the dialysis nurse. The same nurse connected and disconnected her for three evenings. The culture from the patient were negative. The culture from the uh, for the nurse were positive for coagulate negative stuff. Uh, the, the patient was discharged. There was a routine PD fluid analysis that showed 75 white cells, and the culture was negative. <clears throat> but then was there a break in technique? The patient the nurse said, of course not. The patient did two things. They didn't wear a mask two out of three days, and the door remained open one out of three days. So after the, of the presentation, we'll come back to this, and I'll ask you some feedback in terms of what do you think went wrong in these two cases. Now, uh, we have to begin a discussion on peritoneal dialysis-related infection by defining what are we talking about. We're talking about not only peritonitis, but we're talking about exercise infections, as well as subcutaneous tonal infections. If you look at the incidence of peritonitis around the world, there is a remarkable difference among different countries. Israel, for instance, the, 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 the rate of peritonitis is 1.66 episodes per year at risk. That that every seven months, a patient in PD in Israel is suspected to have peritonitis. Now, the other you had Japan, where the episodes per year at risk range from 0.17 to 0.22, meaning that you can take a patient on PD to have a peritonitis episode every 54 to 70 months. In the United States, uh, like in Canada, we are in between these two extremes, and we believe that here uh, every, the, the episode per year at risk uh, vary between 0.24 and 0.32, mean that every 37 to 50 months, a patient is expected to have a peri uh, an episode of peritonitis. The reason for the discrepancies are not understood, but it appears to have to do with the protocols that the DIF programs implement in order to specifically prevent peritonitis. And also, the perception in some of these areas that, that is really important. Needless to say, in Israel, they don't feel that. In Japan, they believe that prevention is really critical to the success of PD. There are several key aspects of preventing peritoneal, peritoneal dialysis-related infections, and I listed them on this slide. Um, you can see how some of these, uh, some of these steps uh, really are beyond your control. The catheter placement and PD-related infection is beyond your control. This happens in a hospital, usually away from your clinic. You often don't see the patient until the patient comes in one or two weeks after the catheter was placed. Same applies to prevention of bowel source infections or bacteremia. Uh, as a source of peritonitis. The other, however, are areas of prevention that uh, you can influence, and by optimizing those areas, you can reduce the incidence of infection. So let's go briefly. Peritoneal monitoring. Uh, it's important to monitor infection rates at least quarterly, at least one, uh, once a year. And there is evidence that when you do this, you get better outcomes. <clears throat> now, the key to success in this, in this business is active approach for CQI. And that means that not only you involve your teammates, your nurses, your physicians, your patients, their families, but you can reach out of the environment to the areas where the peritoneal dialysis patient is treated, and that's the hospital. The hospital place where they get a catheter inserted is the place where they go back when they have intercurrent problems, and how patients are cared for in the hospital, how PD catheter exercise is care is still important and in terms of preventing infection. So when we talk about a approach, it means not only your team in your clinic, but reaching beyond your clinic to the hospital as well. It's also important when you monitor infection to look at the bacteria that cause the infection. It is known because it gives ideas to what happened. Staphylococcus aureus and pseudomonas are almost always due to exercise and tonal infection that, that are complicated by peritonitis. Where well, coagulate negative staphylococcus infections are almost always due to contamination at the time of connection or tubing contamination. 
is now believed by most experts uh, that a rate of 0.36 episodes per patient per year, that means one episode every three years, is a rate of infection that can be reached by most programs. Out of, of course, very rare cases, 0.006 or 0.24, but I think those are in very unique situations. And I think that when you, if you can reduce this infection to one every three years, you can, you, you've done a great, great job. In uh, addition to monitoring the rate of infection, it's important to examine how many patients in a given period, in a given year, are free of peritonitis. This eliminates the situation of one couple of patients in a program that seem to have peritonitis all the time. So a minimum of 80% of patients should be peritonitis free per year. It is, the, it, it is what the guidelines recommend. What about the placement and related infections? Uh, there is no question that uh, the, the standard tank of catheter is as good as any other catheter for peritoneal dialysis. And we mean that this is evidence-based. Antibiotics at the time of insertion decrease infection risk unquestionably. This is something you will have no control on. This is, on, this is a hospital policy, but running at the hospital and making them aware of this is important. Uh, traditionally, the hospital used cephalosporin as a single dose at the time of catheter insertion. There's no evidence that vancomycin is superior to cephalosporin as a prevention of infection after, after the catheter is inserted. Of course, if you are allergic to vancomycin, we we'll have to use a cephalosporin. Uh, it is important to avoid trauma or hematoma during catheter placement, uh, suicide and exercise include the risk of infection, the dressing changes, the PD nurse should be done exclusively, and of course, the exercise should be kept dry and do heals. All these things really don't happen at your clinic. This happens at the hospital. It is common that the patient had the PD catheter inserted. That, that evening, the patient had bleeding. The nurse calls the intern. The intern puts a stitch, and that only calls for exercise infection, inevitably, in the catheter later on. So in order to address this problem, one has to reach out at the hospital and make sure that they are looking at the catheter the way we look at the catheter when the patient comes to visit at the clinic. You know, spiking of dialysis bags poses a very high contamination risk. And washing before filling reduces the risk, and for the use of assist devices or using systems that don't, do not require spiking eliminate this problem. Uh, the peritonitis rates in APD and CAPD are really probably similar, and many papers show that as they indicate. Uh, that's really perplexing to me because you do many more connections in CAPD than in APD, and yet, when you do it right, the risk of infections are similar. And the value of this notion is that uh, when you decide on modality, uh, the risk of peritonitis shouldn't really be a factor in deciding whether to go on APD versus CAPD. Side care. The goal of the side care is to prevent, of course, catheter infection, subcutaneous tunnel infection, and peritonitis. The question that antibiotic protocols reduce the risk of risk of reduce the risk of Staphylococcus aureus infections. And, and it is recommended by the, by the APD guidelines that all PD patients should use topical antibiotics at exercise, intranasally or both. Now, the notion that infectious disease doctors have a great deal of problem with. The use, the routine use of antibiotics in patients will inevitably lead to bacterial resistances. Up to time, there are really no good reports of fetal resistance Resistances in the two most common antibiotics used in muripacine and gentamicin. But the fact of the matter is that if you prevent infection, avoiding the daily use of antibiotics, you're better off in terms of preventing uh, resi bacterial resistances. That's particularly important when you use antibiotics that are used systemically, like gentamicin. Gentamicin is terrific for this, to prevent infections, but if you develop resistance to gentamicin, you lose a valuable antibiotic for the treatment of systemic infections. So what can you do to doing all these things? Well, you can do routine exit care the way you all do it. You use water and you use an antibacterial soap. It's important that when you use antiseptic agents, you avoid toxic concentrations, and this is the list of the toxic concentrations, the most common use, uh, beta and hydrogen peroxide or hexidine and sodium hypochlorite. The pathogens that most commonly cause exercise infection are Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas. And hygiene is absolutely essential before the exercise is examined. 
by either the patient, by the family, or by the member of the pediatric dialysis care team. And this is something that is frequently overlooked and not done consistently. The CDC has now recommended that the best method of providing uh, hygiene is the use of 70% alcohol-based hand rubs. But you have to rub the hand for 15 seconds. That is as long as it's there for the alcohol to evaporate. When you do way, this is the best method available to, uh, to buy hand hygiene. If you have the 70% alcohol, you can wash your hands with chlorhexidine, but you have to wash your hands for 15 seconds. And as you also know, dialysis, no PD nurse has polished nails or artificial nails because there is a lot of evidence that the risk of infection is greatly increased. To prevent staphylococcus aureus infections, uh, it is now known that the use of mupirocin ointment is effective. There is a lot of evidence in the literature. It doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. I believe, and we leave at the Vita, that a good exercise care, as I outlined, is as good as the use of these ointments. Um, the target for staph aureus infection should be really very low, 0.05 patients per year, and that has been achieved in many studies described in that paper, uh, or 0.06 patients per year. And between 200 and 240 months between episodes. That is to say, if we are striving for peritonitis reduction rates to less than one in three years, the rate of exercise infection should be substantially less than that uh, because it is an easy, it's an easy uh, problem to tackle that out of peritonitis. Now, uh, recently there was interest in using polyspoint triple ointment instead of pyrocene uh, because it's cheaper. Unfortunately, there is really no difference. In infection prevention, but it's a high rate of fungal infection with polysporin, so it is not recommended that you use polysporin triple ointment because you may even have the, you with higher incidence of fungal infection, but as you know, are very difficult to treat and to take care of. Now, preventing pseudomonas infections, we spoke a bit about this, gentamicin clearly reduces staph aureus and pseudomonas exercise infection. When this paper came in Jason, everybody was excited, we should all do this. Again, infection disease doctors raise questions about this. When you use gentamicin, you not only increase the risk of fungal exercise infections, but more important, the risk of developing bacterial resistance. And if that happens, you lose a valuable agent for systemic therapy. So we don't believe that the use of gentamicin on a routine basis is really an appropriate thing, and that you can prevent that infection by the other measures that we discussed already. Now, factors associated with peritonitis, uh, prevention of bacterial, in, of, uh, bacterial infections, uh, there are factors associated with peritonitis from enteric organisms that we are familiar with, constipation, infection, diarrhea, hypokalemia, invasive intestinal procedures, uh, all increase the risk of peritonitis from enteric organisms. I all know that constipation is not only bad for this, but because the patient has problems with draining, so we all want the patient you know, to be constipated. Hypokalemia is an interesting. There's no question that hypokalemia increases the incidence of infection and also of small, of small bowel bacterial overgrowth. So many patients with GAPD are hypokalemic, and you know that even those who, con who consume a reasonably good diet uh, for, for, and re for, for unclear reasons. So it's an important factor to remember and to correct if it is a consistent problem in a given patient. Now, uh, the main so the transient, bac transient bacteria that may lead to peritonitis that has been documented. For instance, the patient goes to the dentist, a dental work procedure, and may develop peritonitis. And it's recommended that when the patient has any of these procedures, a single dose of antibiotic like amoxicillin before the procedure is effective in preventing peritonitis. Uh, the area where we need uh, more research. Uh, there are very few papers published in this connection. Now, the, the very important aspect that I want to talk about today is that of training programs. Um, the trainer should be well prepared and have theoretical and clinical skills to communicate with the patient effectively. What does this mean? It means that no how to do PD it doesn't really qualify an RN to train patients to do PD. That's a, a notion that is not really very well appreciated in many, in many programs. All adage that C1, do one, teach one, it just doesn't apply. To, to nurses teaching peritoneal dialysis. I think the PD trainers should focus on home dialysis and having centered hemodialysis responsibilities. This did hit in California 
whether a mini program where you have a PD program near to the hemodialysis program, the nurse sort of pitches in both programs. That is not desirable, particularly it applies to the training. The training protocols are more important than how experienced the nurse is. For instance, patients that are trained by more experienced nurses had actually peritonitis earlier. This is a very perplexing finding, but in that the more experienced nurses have been grown accustomed to doing it way, and by the way, sometimes they skip steps, and therefore more peritonitis occurs. So the protocol and not the experience of the nurse uh, that makes a difference. The curriculum must include washing, drying of hands, and use of hand disinfectant. It's very, very important because, as I said before, in many situations where the patient comes to the clinic, you ask the nurse, what about the exercise? They put, a, they, they put their gloves on and lift the gloves and look at the exercise, and that is incorrect. Leg training varies around the world. It doesn't really correlate with peritonitis rates that have been studied. The patient should be taught what do we mean by contamination and how to handle that. I show our cartoon on the second or third slide. This is a closed system. The minute you open the system, bacteria in the air, in, your, in, your, in, the, in, the, in the air, in the environment, uh, can contaminate the system and produce peritonitis. So the of contamination is very important. Retaining is the key to reducing mistakes. Uh, an interesting uh, paper published in Kindle International showing that task repetition made the brain to learn both cognitive aspects and physical steps of the procedure. What do we mean by this? When you teach the patient to do PD, you only want him to know how to do it, what steps to follow, but to understand and comprehend what he is doing, the rationale for the step that you are teaching him. Or her. Then it's in a late state after early exposure to new information. Therefore, repetition addresses the problem of the tendency to forget things that you have learned for the first time. Memory is enhanced by returning to learning context and cues for correct performance. So, again, repetition and retraining is the key to success. So, consequences to a successful treatment of a PD patient are summarized in this that I use a lot. Tell me and I will forget, show me and I may remember, engage me and I will comprehend. And you see, by engaging the patient in your training, into understanding why they wear a mask, why they wish they had, they wish they had for 15 seconds, and they cannot skip the step, and why they disconnect, they must do that. Once they comprehend that, they are more likely to do it. That if you tell them and, or more commonly done, you give a whole set of papers to read that they're they never, they never going to read. Now, compliance with the exchange procedure is important. This paper showed that six months after the starting PD, patients began to take shortcuts or simply ignore steps taught at the start of the PD. Fifty percent did not wash their hands as they were taught. Fifty percent did not check back for leaks, and ten forgot to wear their mask. Uh, in the paper, uh, in an Italian study, patients who had known PD after 33 months from PD. Uh, the, the investigator used a questionnaire to review patient behavior during a home visit. And the findings were that 34 percent of the patients did not answer the questionnaire accurately as they were supposed to do. 23 percent did not follow the exchange procedures taught during the training. So you always ask the, the question: I mean, am I retraining patients, and do they really understand what they should do? And the next question, of course, is who should be retrained? And this was addressed in a paper in Kenya National. Uh, and, excuse me here. Um, retraining is particularly important in younger patients, those under 55 years of age. I don't understand why this is, but that was the findings of the study. This is the educational level, it makes sense. But in the early phase of PD, less than 18 months, it also makes sense that they should be retrained. Patients in the late phase of PD, more than 36 months, because they may have forgotten, particularly if they haven't had an infection episode, they may have forgotten. The, 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 the step that they were taught during training. Now, how often should patients be retrained? No information available on that. ISPD a guideline suggests that patients should be retrained after hospitalization, after an episode of peritoneal catheter infection, when they have dexterity, vision, or mental acuity. It happens to in diabetic patients, they lose vision or they develop peripheral neuropathy. Uh, they develop, you know, mental problems, uh, uh, cognitive problems, and then every time that happens, they should be really, uh, they should be really retrained. Uh, three after the initial training and yearly thereafter as a 
minimum. I don't think that many programs do this. I think there's good evidence that this should be done. Uh, there are some modifiable risk factors for pericarditis that I just want to mention, uh, and many of them are known to you. Many of them are not, not known to you. Hypovolemia, vitamin D insufficiency, and hypokalemia are the most common factors that are not really appreciated as risk factors for peritonitis, and they may be corrected. The other factor is to hear depression, connection methodology, technique errors, prolonged antibiotic therapy, medical procedures, constipation, initiation of the exercise, or exposure to pets, but better known to you, and probably are factors you are addressing currently in your clinic. What about the conclusions or recommendations? I have two slides here, and I hope you remember half of this. You should tell PD-related infection rates, including bacteria isolated regularly, ideally three months, at least every 12 months. It is also important that you calculate those rates. And one of the papers that I quote in this presentation tells you how to calculate the rates, because it's the only way to standardize uh, the, the, the system. In face of 0.36 episodes per patient per year, or one episode every 33 months, are really rates that are achievable, and I think we're achieving this rate in most of the DABITA programs at this time. Lactic antibiotics, when the catheter is inserted at the hospital, is very important to prevent infection, and ideally vancomycin, a single dose, is the agent of choice. Spiking should be avoided as much as possible. You should also cause to prevent infection by staphylococcus or, and we went over over the infection process we follow on the Vita. Uh, uh, I also mentioned that ointment antibiotics, ointments are of value, but you don't really have to use those if you have a very robust uh, anti-infection program. The rates in APD and CAPD are comparable, and I'm going to remember this because when it comes to frequency of infection, it makes no difference, even though in, uh, even though it, in, you know, in principle, CAPD would be a more likely problem because of more disconnections and connections during the day. PD should be a skilled communicator, and perhaps we should strive for looking at this in more detail, who is training our patients. There are people who have the ability to communicate, there are people who have the ability to communicate, and it has nothing to do with their skill, their knowledge, or their abilities. It has to do with their special ability to convey information, to impact the audience, and to get the people to comprehend what is being taught. Training is the key to reducing <coughs> mistakes that make us infection, Monitoring compliance with the chain procedures that we're taught is important. And finally, develop protocols to determine the frequency of retraining is also important. I will end here. This is the end of my time. Uh, and what I'd like to do is uh, now try to give you some feedback on the two patients that I presented. I'm going to bring up again on the screen so that you remember. Uh, first case was the 55-year-old Caucasian man with CKD5 due to amyloidosis. On PD for years. He was the best patient at the program. He was working with time, excellent accuracy, good biochemical parameters. No one single episode of peritonitis in six years. When a phony, the titanium connector dislodged through the floor, he panicked in his own words, washed his hand with soap and water, water sterile gloves, washed the connector with soap and water, replaced the connector, and dialyzed overnight, but did not call the doctor and did not call the nurse. And of course, pain, nausea, vomiting, went to the AR. He didn't have a fever, but he had signs of peritonitis. The white blood count was normal, but the PD fluid had pleocytosis, blood were negative, PD fluid was staphoreous. He was admitted, treated, and he died. The case, 62-year-old Hispanic female, CKD5, nephrosclerosis, on CCPD for years, and with of peritonitis during the first six months, was admitted elective resection of some lipomas, led to hospital in three days, Two days after discharge, cloudy fluid, low grade fever, uh, and PD fluid containing 250 white cells, blood culture negative, PD fluid groups, coagulant negative staff. She was given vancomycin as a patient. She recovered, but the hospital proceeded to do an epidemiologic investigation. And it was found the CCPD in the hospital was done by dialysis nurses, not by the patient. And the same was connected to this patient three evenings in a row. The initial culture for the patient were negative. But the nurse had quite negative staff. The, the analysis of the PD for the, day, the last day in the hospital showed that the patient had pleocytosis, 175 white cells. Uh, the question was a uh, making technique. When that question was asked to the nurse, of course not. The patient said yes, 
there were two out of three days when the nurse didn't wear a mask, and there was one of three days when the room door remained open. So I to open now as to some fact from uh, from these cases, and also any questions that you may have, and I may try to answer. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind opening up the line for uh, Q&A at this time. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. And while the uh, questions are queued up, I do have a couple of written questions for you, Dr. Rodriguez, and for Tracy Milligan, perhaps. I'll just go ahead and ask them in the order that they received. Uh, for newly placed PD catheters, is there any relationship between when dressing is changed by the PDRN, for example, in seven days versus seven days, et cetera? Uh, the information on that, the, the information that exists is that when the dressing change is done properly, following the strictly aseptic conditions, that the, the, the infection is prevented. But there's no, no evidence that more frequent dressing changes will lead to better outcomes. Thank you. The next question, does the Rx provide uh, comparison for a bundled patient? I don't answer to that question, but the question, do you really want to use mupirocin uh, on your patient on a routine basis? Do you want to use it on exceptional cases, on uh, 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 very special circumstances? That's really the question that we should ask, because uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Upirocin is extremely effective, but so are the uh, preventive uh, anti-infective uh, measures that we have implemented on the data. But that, that, that they, they will provide However, I do believe that if there is a medical necessity and there is a need for that patient, they will provide it. Thank you. And the last question I have written in was, many slides would be helpful when discussing, discussing patient care with the physician presentation available offline? Well, I think that's up to you, Tim. I, 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 I don't know that, the answer to that question. Yeah, with you, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, we could certainly place a version of this presentation on the village web for the teammates reference. I, I, that would be okay with me, yes. Sir. And, and, and I, I, I like that idea. I think that physicians are very responsive to to uh, evidence-based, uh, you know, information. I think when the nurse engages the doctor in a dialogue and he uses evidence-based information, not only does that, that give the physician the feeling that the nurse knows what she's talking about, but 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 it's easier to interact with him and to get things done. Yes, I like that, and I don't have any problem with it. So I'll then place this on the web after the fact, along with the recording of this WebEx today for your reference. Thank you. Those are, I do more, question in, but let me pause at this time to see any questions uh, live from the audience. Tracy, questions out there? Question from Robert Henson. Your hand is open. Dr. Rodriguez, um, it would regard to the cases, um, the case, I wonder whether or not the issue comes down to the fact that the patient had amyloidosis and did not receive intraperitoneal vancomycin. Ordinarily, one would presume with amyloidosis, if we did not have an ultrafiltration failure, that intravenous vancomycin should be effective, but vancomycin is a rather large molecule. And as a result, it may not have gotten intraperitoneal um, concentrations adequate to take care of the peritonitis, even though the patient received intravenous uh, vancomycin. In that situation, uh, since the patient was taken care of um, by other than the PD nurse, uh, I wonder whether or not combined therapy would actually been more appropriate than just intravenous uh, vancomycin. Yeah, that's a very, very good question, Robert. Actually, that was done because the infectious disease doctor who was advising on the case raised the same issue that you're raising. That is, uh, we'll be sure that the, the particularly the membrane will not, be, will not become an issue in terms of, uh, of penetration of the antibiotics. So he was given both 
uh, intraperitoneal vancomycin and IV vancomycin. The blood levels were monitored and were kept at a therapeutic range of about 18 to 20 micrograms, uh, milligrams per liter. So that wasn't really the issue. I think the, 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 he had a lot of complications after this. Uh, he had a pulmonary embolus, uh, all because of the sepsis, of course, the infection, and he ultimately died. But, but the antibody therapy was, was appropriate. But, but, the, but the, the question I hope to get from you is why do you think this happened to this excellent patient, this great patient? This is the best patient you want to have in your program. So why, why would this oh, yeah. happen? Well, that's simple. He had a technique break, and he did not call. The rule in my unit is I've never yelled at a patient for calling. I have yelled at patients for not calling. All new patients are told that. It is not their responsibility to figure out what's going on. It is their responsibility to call. Yes, that's true, and that everybody's taught. But, but I submit to you that this patient never confronted this problem for six years, and he and his words panic. And he really forgot what he was taught six years ago in terms of doing this, because this patient will come to the clinic once a month, or twice a month, one for the lab, one for the clinic, and he never came back because he was doing very well. So when he confronted that problem, uh, he, I guess he forgot, or he did back, which is the same, of course, that he ought to do what you just said, and he didn't do it. And he didn't do it, and this was perplexing because he was a good patient. So it goes back to the business of retraining and reminding patients, you know, periodically what they have to do. Uh, that might be the issue here. And I think that's the conclusion we had when we look at this case because we were very disturbed by what happened. We lost the patient in the program uh, because he failed to do something that he was taught six years before. So uh, I guess the, from our perspective, we thought this is why training patients is so important because we cannot assume that they're going to remember, they're going to do this, the step that we're taught, particularly when they haven't confronted the problem for so many years. The problem that I'm having and that I hope you can kick up the line, and that is when does the patient become the dialysis patient? I make the referral for a peritoneal catheter. That is not anything dialysis. That patient, after that there is placed, should become the patient of the peritoneal dialysis training nurse. But until we have a start date, they cannot be entered into the disease system. So therefore, the peritoneal dialysis training nurse, the individual, as you pointed out in your slides, who should be taking care of that patient is not able to be involved in the care of that patient. The peritoneal dialysis training should be the one who makes sure they have their uh, intrasal and topical mupirocin prior to the surgery. The nurse should be doing the post uh, catheter placement catheter care, but we can't actually have that nurse involved until actually a start date is signed. That's an issue. That is an issue, and to solve that issue, we have to reach out uh, to the the place of catheter is placed. I think one of the things that we're doing in the Dream Team here. In, 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 in California, is trying to link our hospital-based programs where we have a contract with, uh, to provide dialysis services with the peritoneal dialysis program. So when the patient enters the program, uh, when the patient is admitted to the hospital and is being, the catheter is being placed, the PDS is involved from there on. And right. by the time when the patient goes to the but you raise a very good point, and this is a big problem because in a competitive environment like what we have in the West, this happens all the time. The patient Patient is admitted, is taken care of by somebody else. You have patients who come to the clinic with an infection before you have done any exchange or done anything to them because of the poor care that is given. I don't think the hospitals understand this, but they will, and they should now that they're going to be hit in the park in their pockets for readmissions or for infections. They're going to understand that. So I think here yeah, with this problem, we have to collaborate, go out our our our, our clinic with the hospitals or the places where these patients are cared for. Very important point, yes. Dr. Rodriguez, this is Tracy Milligan, Senior Director of Clinical Services for the Home Modalities with DeVita. And I would just like to let you know, as well as letting Robert know, that we have recently developed a process where the patient can come to a DeVita clinic with a physician's order prior to the start date to receive one PD flush and two dressing changes. Has been training that's gone out 
not to all nurses. We are able to enter the patient into SNAPI as an ESRD, uh, not as an ESRD, excuse me, as a stage one through stage five CKD patient so that we can take care of those patients. They will then really technically become a DaVita patient on the first day of training. We are trying to make this an easier process so that we can take care of those patients. Um, can, can I interject a quick thing? It's just logical to me that the day of peritoneal dialysis catheter referral should be the first day because the PD nurse should be involved before the surgery occurs. And we have that available. But we need to have the physician refer that patient to the PD facility where the nurse can enter that patient as a stage one through stage five CKD patient. We can mark where we want the PD catheter to be placed. Excellent. We can take care of the patient and follow them until such time as they need to start training. Great. I think, I think that's excellent. I think that the challenge for us is to implement that because, uh, you know, there's a physician in there, and, but, but that is great. That's great. That's the way it should be done. If we can, if we can figure out the way to, to get the physicians involved in thinking that the PNS is the absolutely key person. And as I mentioned, where is the catheter going to be placed? I don't think any patient should go to the OR without the PD and having seen the patient and having a dialogue with the doctor and discussing where the catheter is going to be placed. But that's an often happen. So any, any efforts in that direction are, are great. Thank you. Your question comes from the line of Mark Sadler. Then it's open. Hi, sir. It's Mark Sadler. Thanks for a great presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. A um, couple of comments and a question. Um, one comment is I would love to get the um, text of the talk, uh, as was mentioned earlier. I think it would be really helpful for um, staff training. And I think with regard to the cases, I think they're very illuminating, and the thing that links the two of them is complacency. In this case, complacency on the part of the patient who I think uh, had gone so long without peritonitis that he may have felt that um, he's uh, sort of uh, immune to it. The second case, perhaps some complacency on the part of the nurse who was taking care of the patient who had um, fallen down in her technique, perhaps because she had gotten away with it before. The um, question for you is, um, do you see any uh, visual cultures? Uh, on patients and staff, if so, do you routinely treat ethyl staff with um, topical antibiotics? We routinely nasal cultures. Uh, we do nasal culture on patients who first come to the to the to the uh, clinic uh, to P to the PD program, and in the party we do treat them. Uh, we also do cultures when the patient presents with an exercise infection, particularly. But we do them routinely on everybody. We do them on the first the patient when they first come in. I would treat them either positive or patients who develop an infection. With regards to your comments, they're very well taken. Uh, I do think that in the second case, indeed, uh, in this particular hospital, the hemo nurses do PD. And, 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 and it's, it's easy for the hemo nurse who does PD and CRRT and hemodialysis uh, to, to forget but when they don't do it often. So we initiate a program with the hospital collaboration to try to bring PD nurses uh, to the hospital so they can be a resource for the nurses who do the renal repayment therapy uh, service in the hospital. Uh, also, with regards to the patient, we asked the patient, didn't you know that that, that was wrong? She said, yes, I knew that. I said, why didn't you tell the nurse? But the patient knew that it was wrong not to wear a mask, but never told that to the nurse. The patient was assuming that, I guess the patient didn't comprehend the value of that, and when we said to her, is your cavity that's going to get infected, is she breathes on you bacteria? Now the patient on the sample the next time around, she will tell, even the nurse and is in the hospital, they'll tell you please wear a mask. So, so that was the second lesson we learned from that particular case. But uh, your comments are appreciated, Mark. Thanks. Any additional questions on the line at this time? No further questions at this time. And I do have a couple addition, additional questions that were written in. Uh, you might be able to comment on these, Dr. Rodriguez. Regarding the scenarios, number two, 
The hospital could benefit from education on technique. How does DeVita cross the barrier to educate the hospital if DeVita is not an affiliate? That's a challenge. And a challenge. But I'll tell you one thing we could do. I think that we can reach out to those hospitals where we don't have a connection or a contract to provide acute dialysis services and impact on them the value of, 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 of using good practices in terms of peritonitis prevention. Uh, the in a foundation uh, of Southern California, the local chapter, the medical advisory board, we're working on a program exactly in that direction. We'll reach out to hospitals who are not a hospitals, and we're going to try to impact on them the value of all the things that lead to prevent, uh, preventing infections. And that's the best we can really do because our patients, our DeVita patients, do go to a hospital that doesn't have the DeVita contract in the acute services. But I think that the best we can do is really reach out to them and impact on them. I think hospitals would be more likely to listen now that they're going to get hit in the pocket if the patient is readmitted with infection or they're readmitted too soon. It's an opportunity to do that, but that's about the only way to do it. I don't know about the way to do that. What opportunity, and it's something direct, but we might be able to leverage some of our, v, or some of our VSPs such as uh, Factor, uh, for instance, to talk to those hospitals as they have relationships as well. Yeah, that's a good point, and I think we, we never thought about that, but I think, I think that's a very good point, uh, and, and then be a resource. I think, I think the, the, the networks may help us a lot more because hospitals listen to networks, and, and when they hear from the network, uh, they think it's important. And as I said, the hospitals are beginning to ask questions about infections, so the, the opportunity now to reach out the hospitals trying to impact on the, 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 the vita culture that we have in terms of preventing infection, so that they should adopt for their own benefit. Indeed. Uh, question here, is it absolutely necessary for a patient to return to the surgeon's office for a follow-up appointment when the office is doing non-sterile dressing changes less than one week after surgery, or would it be appropriate for the PD nurse at the vita to get orders from the nephrologist change the dressing at the clinic and avoid the surgeon's office altogether. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, and I think there's something that we never, we have implemented, we have uh, gotten down to using one and a half surgeons uh, to do catheters in our program, where the patients are referred to our program. So it has led to uh, eliminating uh, surgeon visits. The surgeon knows that. The surgeon uh, calls the nurse, uh, uh, often comes to the clinic at uh, to, to look at the patient and uh, decide where the catheter is going to be inspected, and he doesn't really have to see the patient. I think the, 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 the value of, of the change is that one surgeon knows that this has got to be done by somebody who has expertise. He doesn't really have to see that patient, and they don't want to see the patient. They don't get paid for seeing the patient once more. So I think that just goes back to the old, the old uh, routine of seeing the, the surgeon once after the operation, but in this particular case, there's no value of that. But the same token, that surgeon could be key in the OR in terms of monitoring that when he finishes the operation and the, page, the catheter is dressed, the worst in the catheter is, from, you know, the, the guy that we use in the outpatient clinics. But I, I don't think that there's any need to do that. But, but you to work with surgeons, really. I mean, in a program, we have, let's say, one and a half, one, one surgeon and another guy when he's not in town. And, and it works pretty well from that perspective. You have many surgeons around, it's more difficult. Any others at this time? You have another question from the phone. Oh, they disconnected. Okay. Well, now uh, show sorry. This sorry, is Jeffrey. Again, and I have a quick question for you. Um, on one of your slides, you talked about vitamin D insufficiency being a risk for peritonitis. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit better, please? Well, that's really only an association that has been that has been made, uh, and there is a publication on that. that I, I don't have the reference in there. There's no real reason why this would be the case, other than to say that patients with very vitamin D levels are usually very malnourished, and perhaps it's the malnutrition rather than the vitamin D deficiency itself. Now, as you know, you know this thing is getting to paper because, as you know, vitamin D is a terrific one and it has to do with lymphoid, lymphoid cell and the immune system operation. So that, so that it makes sense that when you're vitamin D deficient, your, your oxonic mechanism, your antibacterial mechanism are impaired. Uh, the information is only an association, uh, an association. And I think something important 
system because these patients usually are malnourished and they ought to be they ought to be looked uh, you know not only with the vitamin D deficiency but a nutritional status per se. Thank you. We have no, I'm sorry. Um, Tracy? Sorry, we have a question now from the phone line. Great, and this has to be the last one. Hey, Susan Keys, your line is open. Yeah, um, my question is, uh, would it be appropriate for, like, a male <clears throat> that was doing um, their PD exchange that had um, work hands or whatever and had hands that were chronically dirty, even though they wash them, would it be appropriate for them to glove and then in between use hand sanitizer with the gloves on or not? I, 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 what is the situation where the man has dirty hands? He has a female worked on vehicles or, you know. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. okay. Would but, it be yeah, good, good point. That, that, that would be okay. I do think that the studies that have been done, even in men with dirty hands, show that when you sanitize, as recommended by the CDC, if you wash your hands with soap and water or chlorhexidine for 15 seconds, or when you use alcohol for 70% for 15 seconds, and you do cultures on those hands, they're negative. Okay. So provided you follow those, those guidelines, I think that it's safe to assume that you get enough disinfection to minimize uh, uh, infection. You would say it would be contraindicated to wear gloves and sanitize the gloves. I don't think it would be contraindicated, but it would probably be a you know, no use contraindicated. Can use gloves, of course. The glove, but but it, but it is the hand sanitation that is the key, the key element. Surgeons in the OR scrub for 15, 10 minutes. Because mm -hmm. once you sanitize your hands, you know, because the bacteria can penetrate the gloves. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Great. I think we'll go ahead and stop here. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone again for participating. I want to especially thank Dr. Rodriguez for taking time away from his busy schedule. Obviously, I think we all agree that he did a great job. It was a very informative pr presentation, and we will make slides available after the fact. Be sure to join us for our next webinar that's scheduled for November 9th. It's Managing Comorbidities in PD Patients, Hypertension, Congestive Heart Failure, this will be hosted by Dr. Raj Marotra. As for those nurses in attendance today, you're eligible to receive one CE code for today's presentation. The course code is CEC2140 eval. Again, that's CEC2140 eval. I did put that up in the chat box. Hopefully, you have that on your screen as well. Then have a great day and a great weekend. Take care. This is today's conference call. You may now disconnect.